This recording is a product of Audiobooks Incorporated, Box 16428, Fort Worth, Texas, 76133. Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Beter. Today is October 15, 1975, and this is my monthly audio letter number 5. One year ago this month, I made my first cassette tape recording for Audiobooks Incorporated. It was entitled, How to Protect Yourself During the Coming Depression and Third World War, and was released as Audio Book No. 1. Stop and think what has happened since then. It may startle you. In October 1974, our government was still assuring us there was no recession. But the very next month the government announced that there was a recession underway, and today, a year later, we have already endured what is officially the worst recession since the late 1930s. But we haven't seen anything yet. As I say these words, we are again being fed optimistic lies by Rockefeller agents and our government from President Ford on down when we are actually poised on the brink of a far worse economic cliff than the one we fell over a year ago. In this regard, I want to talk to you today about the following three topics. Number 1. The CIA, Fort Knox, and the poisoning of America. Number 2. How the Rockefeller Brothers are preparing to sacrifice New York City to trigger general economic collapse. And number 3. The continuing build-up to a new United States Constitution and war in Asia. Topic number 1. On September 19, just a few weeks ago, a mini-scandal involving the United States Bureau of the Mint broke nationwide. The Great Penny Caper, in the words of the Wall Street Journal. Two years ago the Treasury had one and a half million experimental aluminum pennies minted, supposedly at the suggestion of Mrs. Mary Brooks, the Director of the United States Mint. Samples went to Senate and House Banking Committee members, and a few went to Mrs. Brooks' own office. In the end, the aluminum penny idea was scrapped, and all those million-plus experimental coins were melted down. All that is, except a dozen or so that seem to have disappeared in the Senate, the House, and the Bureau of the Mint offices. Since they are potentially worth thousands of dollars as collector's items, the government professes great concern about the situation and may even be forced to mint the low-quality aluminum pennies after all if they can't be recovered. An Assistant United States Attorney said, quote, this may just turn out to be the world's worst blunder by the Bureau of the Mint, an egregious case of negligence." Unquote. Well, my friends, here is a perfect example of the look-over-there distraction tactics that the Rockefellers always use. They make a big to-do about a few pennies while they cover up the Fort Knox gold scandal. They're playing games with you and me. We have also heard a lot lately about the United States intelligence community, the CIA, the FBI, and so on, and a lot of pro and cons about it. First there was the CIA whitewash by CIA boss Nelson Rockefeller, with the able assistance of his good friend and Trojan horse Ronald Reagan, who, by the way, is presently in line to be Nelson's Vice President once Gerald Ford is out of the way. More recently there have been the lurid revelations by the Senate Intelligence Committee, chaired by one Senator Frank Church, assassination plots against Castro poison dark guns to stun guard dogs at enemy installations, all manner of James Bond-style murder weapons, and even deadly shellfish toxins kept by the CIA despite Presidential orders to destroy them. Strong stuff, you say? Wrong. The Church Committee, like the Treasury with its pennies, is playing games with you and me again. 
The United States Senate hearings on shellfish toxins last month did not reveal anything except the tip of the iceberg. The same applies to what they have not told you about assassinations, psychological programming, and other things. As usual, the government is telling you just enough to make you think you have been told the truth while keeping you in the dark about what really matters. So I'm going to tell you a thing or two about what really goes on in the Rockefeller Brothers Espionage Network. I believe what I am about to reveal, my friends, is actually mind-boggling. It's tragic. It's frightening. And frankly, it borders on the unbelievable. But my information, which I have carefully double-checked, comes from sources which have been proven absolutely reliable in the past. Therefore, the absolute truth to the very best of my knowledge. And I believe you have a right to know the truth about the things that affect your life, your health, and your destiny. Senator Church's committee made a big publicity splash over the 11 grams, less than half an ounce, of the shellfish toxin kept by the CIA in defiance of Presidential orders. But they have known for over a month now about something far worse than those shellfish toxins, something that is a direct, immediate threat to unsuspecting citizens right now and they are not telling you about it. CIA operatives have stolen from 40 to 60 pounds, pounds, not ounces or grams, of deadly radioactive plutonium-239 from various stations in the United States. Plutonium-239 is the deadliest substance imaginable and is the material used for nuclear weapons. And these 40 to 60 pounds of stolen plutonium have been processed into an incredibly dangerous, radioactive, super-poison so lethal that one gram, one twenty-eighth of an ounce, is enough to kill over 60,000 people. And this insane illegal poison is now stored in the Central Core Vault at Fort Knox. The Central Core Vault, which was originally designed to house the nation's gold, has been emptied of that gold and turned by the Rockefeller's spy an establishment into a chamber of death containing enough radioactive super-poison to kill over one-third of the world's population. Shellfish toxins my eye. But my friends, you still haven't heard the worst of it. The clandestine operation involving the plutonium poison was not only insane, but it has been botched as well. This radioactive liquid poison in the central core vault is stored in a number of lead-lined casks that somewhat resemble large milk cans, milk cans in outer appearance. Most of these were put there as long ago as 1968, even before the last of the gold left Fort Knox. They have not been subject to the safety precautions spelled out for radioactive materials by the former Atomic Energy Commission, and the containers began corroding long ago. Leakage began occurring several years ago as a result and is steadily accelerating now. The entire United States Bullion Depository at Fort Knox and its environs are already contaminated with radioactivity and it is increasing daily. But you may ask, how can these things have happened? How could the gold have been taken out from under the Army's nose? And how could the CIA or anyone else have sneaked 
this plutonium poison into Fort Knox. Everyone knows Fort Knox is impregnable." End of quote. My friends, the answer is so simple it may amaze you. First, I must correct one erroneous item contained in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 2 for July 1975. It is true that it takes two keys and two people to open the vaults in the Bullion Depository, but the Commanding General of Fort Knox is not one of them. The two people with the keys are the Treasury Agent in Charge and his deputy, both Treasury officials. Furthermore, control and authority over the Depository building and the immediate grounds within the fence surrounding it lies exclusively with the Treasury Department. The United States Army has no authority whatsoever over the Bullion Depository. The Army never becomes involved in any way with the activities at the Depository except when the Treasury requests Army guard duty for major shipments of gold. What you probably think of as Fort Knox, the famous Bullion Depository with small grounds and a fence around it, is properly called the United States Bullion Depository at Fort Knox, Kentucky. It is a little Treasury Island located geographically within a huge Army reservation that is called Fort Knox. Access to the Bullion Depository is possible without passing through any Army guard stations and without the Army even having to pay any attention. There is a controlled access divided public highway, US 31W, that runs from Louisville north of Fort Knox south to Elizabethtown, and it runs smack through the middle of the huge Fort Knox military reservation. If you stay on that highway, you can drive all the way through Fort Knox without stopping or being interfered with in any way. But if you take any of the exits onto a crossroad within the Fort Knox Reservation, then you will come to a guardhouse within a few hundred feet. Driving north or south along Highway 31W through Fort Knox, you come to a point at which you get a good view of the imposing Bullion Depository, which sits on a hill perhaps a quarter mile east of the highway. If you take the nearest exit from Highway 31W, you find yourself on a crossroad that goes right past the Depository, right up to an Army guardhouse where you will, of course, be stopped. But about 50 feet before you reach the Army guard, there is a wide driveway that leads into the Bullion Depository itself. If you turn into that driveway, the Army guard 50 feet down the road will certainly see you, but he need not take any action. Instead, it's up to the Treasury guards to either admit you or keep you out of the Depository grounds itself. Thus the Bullion Depository at Fort Knox is virtually impregnable for any potential thieves from the outside. The Treasury people at the Depository need only squawk once for help, and the Army will be swarming all over the area in moments. But for an inside job, through the Treasury itself, the Bullion Depository is a sitting duck. Access to the Depository is exactly the same as it would be if the Depository were loca located clear outside the Fort Knox Military Reservation, since no Army checkpoints have to be passed. And inside the fence that surrounds the Depository building, everything is strictly up to the Treasury unless they call upon the Army for assistance. So the Treasury Department had to come to terms at some level with the intelligence people responsible for the radioactive plutonium poison. The United States Treasury is now acting as a nuclear banker for the United States intelligence community, which works for the Rockefeller Brothers. They wanted to put their deadly valuables in a great big safety deposit box the Central Corps Vault, and the Treasury allowed them to do so. 
The people who went to Fort Knox last year on September 23, 1974, six Congressmen, one Senator, and over 100 news media people, were all exposed to this radiation without their knowledge. Far from being warned of this hazard, the very existence of the Central Core Vault was deliberately hidden from the unsuspecting visitors. As a result, every one of those visitors has grounds for a lawsuit against the Federal Government and against the Treasury officials personally responsible for this terrible trick under the Federal Tort Claims Act. Had I known about the radioactive plutonium poison at that time, I would have publicly warned everyone to stay away. As it is now, all I can do is to suggest that those who visited Fort Knox last year be checked up medically. It is even more urgent than those who work at the depository be checked. I am informed that those who have worked there for a sufficient period of time may already have the beginnings of cancer. Most doctors are unfamiliar with the effects of radiation poisoning, and it can easily be misdiagnosed. Elevated blood sugar, irritability, dizziness, itching, elevated temperature, and a number of other symptoms can result from radiation poisoning. For further information, I refer you to that wonderful book are You Radioactive? by Linda Clark. Knowing what we know now, it is obvious why the man who invited the visitors to Fort Knox last year, United States Treasury Secretary William Simon, knew better than to go there himself. It also explains why the government has so steadfastly refused to admit the existence of the Central Core Vault. They dare not open it now even for a peep show. And on October 9, just last week, if you will recall, President Ford abruptly canceled, yes, canceled, a scheduled trip to Louisville, Kentucky near Fort Knox. And just 16 hours earlier I had publicly broken the plutonium poison story in Los Angeles. Before that, our puppet President probably knew nothing about it. But why has the Church Committee of the Senate, which has had information about all of this for over a month, kept this so carefully covered up? Has Senator Frank Church, whose Presidential ambitions are well known, found what he considers a better use for this life and death information than to tell the American people about it? Up to now, the main effects of the radioactive contamination seeping out of the Central Core Vault have been confined mostly to the immediate vicinity of the Bullion Depository itself. But the Central Core Vault was never intended to house radioactive substances. Its walls, ceiling, and floors are made of reinforced concrete several feet thick, but any such concrete structures formed thousands of cracks all through it over a period of time, some visible, some microscopic. That makes no difference for gold storage, but for radioactive materials the concrete structure of the central core vault is like a giant sieve with tiny holes on all sides. Once the radioactive poison gets out of those lead-lined storage tank cans, as it already is doing, a good fraction of it will eventually find its way outside. A major catastrophe, radioactive poisoning of the entire southeast portion of the United States, is now a real possibility unless steps are taken to prevent it. But I am informed that there is no way to neutralize this radioactive poison. All that can be done is to seal it off from the environment. Even if there were some other safe place to take the leaking cans of poison for storage, which there is not, it would not be safe to open the Central Core Vault now, much less enter it. This means that the United States Bullion Depository at Fort Knox 
must be abandoned forthwith, and a massive tomb of lead and rock built around it to contain the radiation. The contents of the depository, any leftover dregs of gold still there, the stores of curare poison and other drugs and poisons for the intelligence community, Bureau of Engraving Plates, important documents, everything has already been subjected to radioactive contamination and are unsafe so that they might just as well be entombed with the depository itself. Needless to say, a project like this, the abandonment of the Bullion Depository, and the construction of a radiation shielding mound over it could scarcely be done and kept secret. Thousands of people drive by the Depository every day on the public highway, US 31W, and even if that highway were closed. The fate of the Bullion Depository would necessarily become known if these corrective steps were taken, but that would lead back to the source of the trouble, the Rockefeller Brothers themselves, through their intrigues with the CIA, FBI, and the rest of the United States Intelligence Establishment. The only way the Rockefellers can protect themselves in this hideous thing they have caused is not to do anything so that no questions will be asked. By the time the spreading effects of the radioactive leakage from Fort Knox can no longer be hidden, they expect to have their dictatorship in place. Then they can do whatever is necessary without worrying about you or I or anybody else. Think about it. Therefore nothing will be done about the hideous, invisible killer fog slowly creeping outward from Fort Knox unless the public knows about it and demands action. Yet Senator Frank Church contends himself with a public posture of shock at a mere half ounce of shellfish toxin, and even those are not being destroyed. If you will notice, the Church Committee merely voted to suggest to the CIA that its stockpile of shellfish toxin be turned over to scientific agencies for research. That's like saying, if, you, if you'd like to, why don't you take the poison flask out of your left hand and put it in your right hand instead? Senator Ch uh, Church has his publicity. The CIA, FBI, and the rest of the Rockefeller spy network still have easy access to their beloved poisons. The public has been given an exciting show and made to think everything is being straightened out and the real secrets of the Rockefeller Brothers end up more secure than ever. If our Republic is to survive, this kind of thing has got to stop. In other ways, too, the CIA and its brothers in the United States intelligence industry are knee-deep in things about which you are not being given the slightest hint. The Rockefeller spy and espionage establishment specializes in poisoning minds as well as bodies. I refer especially to the many techniques of psychological programming which they have at their disposal. Even President Nixon, after all, was watergated out of office through an elaborate CIA plot on Nelson Rockefeller's behalf that pivoted around psychological profiling of Nixon and many of those who surrounded him in the White House. An artificial environment was created at the White House during the Watergate siege with predictable results based on the psychological profiles of Nixon and his aides. After it was all over, you may recall, some of the Nixon people expressed confusion and amazement at what had happened. They could not understand how they had lost their way and become totally divorced from reality. But this is only one aspect of the psychological control exercised on selected individuals by the Rockefellers through their intelligence web. They also have a variety of brainwashing techniques, including highly advanced secret electronic devices. All that is necessary to use certain of these techniques is to get a victim into a hospital. Once he or she is there, it's all over. In this controlled environment, 
a millivolt system with small electrodes is used to alter the brain wave pattern and inject thoughts and tendencies. As a result, a person can actually be programmed to do things they normally would not, say, to leak information from a Congressional Committee doing special investigative work, or a world leader can be programmed to change his policies, or the wife of a diplomat can be turned into a spy, or a world leader can be assassinated by a close relative programmed to do so, or a true patriot can be programmed to assassinate a political leader or a potential presidential candidate. In all of these cases, the brainwashing techniques permanently damage a person's mind. It is terrible, alien to our way of life, but it is going on right now on behalf of those self-proclaimed philanthropists, the four Rockefeller brothers. I know of specific instances of every one of the programming situations I just gave you, but suffice it to mention only one. Sarah Jane Moore, who took a shot at President Ford in San Francisco on September 22, 1975. Unlike the incident 17 days earlier with Squeaky Fromm, the attempt by Mrs. Moore was real. Had President Ford gone across the street as planned to mingle with the crowd, he would have gone exactly where she stood patiently waiting with her gun, which she had picked out for purchase the previous day with a United States Treasury agent by her side. You may have been baffled by all the accounts of her attempts to get arrested ahead of time and her unsuccessful efforts to stop herself, but she truly could not help herself because she was electronically brainwashed and programmed as an assassin by Rockefeller intelligence agents. Only last night, October 14, 1975, still another odd occurrence happened to President Ford. He was involved in a traffic accident, so-called, as his motorcade drove through downtown Hartford, Connecticut, and for the third time in a row an apparent brush with possible death by the President was caught beautifully by the TV news cameras, which just happened to be riding in the motorcade this time, three cars behind the President. The limousine President Ford was riding in was supposedly the same one JFK rode in when he was killed, but 90% rebuilt. Due to the accident last night, it will, of course, have to go into the Ford Motor Company shops for repair in Detroit. Will it return to service, outfitted once again as a murder car, as it was that day of November 22, 1963 in Dallas? After all, the Rockefeller Brothers have a habit of using any trick that proves successful over and over again. Now I turn to Topic No. 2. On October 2, 1975, while cheery promises of economic recovery were emanating from Washington, the largest financial collapse in retailing history occurred. The huge W.T. Grant Department Stores chain, with over a thousand stores in 40 states, filed for protection under Chapter 11 of the Bankruptcy Act. Tempted by the booming years of the late 1960s and early 1970s, the chain had expanded at breakneck speed and was caught high and dry when our economy began to crumble two years ago. Suddenly, in the changed economic environment, Grant simply could not find enough buyers for its goods to cover its liabilities. Bankruptcy came with the chain owing over $1 billion more than all of its assets put together. But companies are not the only things that can go bankrupt. On October 2, 1975, a major firm that rates government bonds suddenly and completely suspended all ratings on New York City bonds. 
it had become apparent that the city's finances were in bad, bad trouble. New York City, like W.T. Grant, was in over its head. Frantic maneuverings ensued in order to try to keep New York City afloat, including creation of the Municipal Assistance Corporation, or Big Mac as it is often called. With that, New York State was drawn into the city's tangle of financial woes, and now the state's bond ratings are on the way down too. Experts confirm what is all too obvious to everyone. It is now only a matter of time until New York State and City default on their crushing debts as they come due. The result will be legal and financial panic and confusion as creditors, City employees, welfare recipients, bondholders, and others are thrown into a battle to try to get their money. City services will be cut back. Unemployment in New York will skyrocket due to layoffs. People who have put their life savings into so-called safe New York City bonds will be in danger of seeing it all go up in smoke. This is the exact situation that I warned disbelieving Wall Street bond traders about in a seminar in January of this year, 1975. All of this is likely to happen within just a few weeks just in time for Christmas, unless Federal or quasi-Federal authorities step into the picture with some sort of temporary bailout scheme. But will this happen? One of the main contingent plans of the Rockefeller Brothers is to let New York go down the drain. They themselves bailed out months ago so that they will not personally suffer if New York goes bankrupt. Therefore. They are in a perfect position to use the state and city's financial collapse for three purposes. First, to trigger the general economic collapse for which they have worked so long. Second, to be able to label our coming crash the Ford Depression so that Nelson Rockefeller can then ride out on his white horse like FDR did 42 years ago, proclaiming himself our Savior. And third, to convince the American people that the United States Congress has become a totally worthless institution so that the Congress can be abolished in the course of setting up their new Constitution and dictatorship. The plight of New York City and State, after all, is not unique as you may think. The deteriorating financial condition of all of the government bodies with local governments least able to fight back is a deliberate and predictable product of the economic forces unleashed by the Rockefeller Brothers four years ago. The era of stagflation and monetary instability entered, in, entered its current phase in the spring of 1971 through Rockefeller manipulation of their multinational corporations. In my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, published in 1973, I called it Campaign May. I now quote, starting on page 32, It happened on signal. It was May 1971. The affiliates of the multinationals, armed with dollars, opened their spring offensive. They dropped bombs of dollars on Europe. The Europeans, as they had attempted in 1967-1968, tried again to rescue the American dollar. The multinationals sent waves and waves of dollars against the central bankers until these bankers were compelled to stop supporting the dollar by giving out high fixed-price currencies. The time had come to think of their own currencies and what they were doing to their own economies. The dollar began to float. It had become free from a fixed rate in relation to other European currencies. It had, in effect, become devalued, softer." Unquote. Then came August 15, 1971. Mark it well, my friends, the date when our current inflation really began, August 15, 1971. The Rockefellers, through their government lackeys, persuaded President Nixon to repudiate the 1944 Bretton Woods Monetary Agreement by suspending settlement of international transactions in gold. 
since the Rockefeller Brothers had already stolen almost all of America's gold by then. This action, severing the dollar from gold, set in motion an inflationary force greater than America had ever experienced in the 20th century. Continuing on page 81 of my book, the predictable effect on governmental bodies such as New York City was pointed out as follows, and I quote, the waves of campaign may had reached the shores of America. The war against the dollar in Europe was coming home to Americans in the form of high prices and social unrest. The impact of the econo-strategic and econo-politic measures of the new imperialism of the Rockefeller Brothers will be felt for many years in the United States. The legislative bodies of the local, state, and federal government will be incapable of coping with the situation we call stagflation, that is, the problem previously referred to of high inflation combined with a lack of real growth in the economy. Still quoting, after two official devaluations followed by unofficial devaluations as a result of the floating dollar. The value of the dollar in terms of goods and services bought is going down and down, buying less and less. The valuation of the dollar is a presage of increased inflation. The burden of devaluation ultimately falls on the average working man, the pensioner, and those on fixed incomes. It erodes savings accounts, bonds and other fixed income instruments. It also takes more dollars for local, state, and federal programs." Unquote. Thus, thanks to the stagflation era launched deliberately by the Rockefeller Brothers several years ago, mounting deficits by New York City were inevitable as they simply tried to maintain programs and services which had begun under a non-stagflationary economy. The same applies to the Federal Government itself, which is now running a record, record deficit half again as large as that experience at the height of World War II. If the point is reached when New York cannot pay its massive obligations to creditors, then at least some of those creditors will in turn have trouble paying off their obligations and loans. This process can therefore ripple through our general economy, but in normal non-stagflation times it would die out and be absorbed after some point. But the American economy is now dangerously top-heavy with debt, much of it owned by the way to the huge major banks, insurance companies, and the Federal Reserve System all controlled by the Rockefellers, who therefore stand to pick up an awful lot of property through foreclosures. Recent figures indicate that corporations taken all together have twice as much debt as liquid assets. Worse yet, two years ago we passed the point at which the total debt of the United States, governmental, business, and personal, exceeded our total assets. In other words, our whole country is now like a great big WT grant operating with a negative net worth. Should our nation's debt structure collapse badly in one spot, say New York City, the whole thing can start falling down progressively like a house of cards. There is no solid debt-free financial underpinning left to absorb this process and make it fizzle out. One way or another, therefore, it is only now a question of time whether the government and or the Federal Reserve will leap into our collapsing economic situation and their so-called solution for our problems will come down ultimately to printing more dollars. Inflation will then skyrocket even faster than now. Any remaining confidence in the dollar will be shattered, and all of this will come along just in time to send gold prices streaking upward. 
under the conditions which David Rockefeller has labored so hard to finally achieve. I discussed this last month in connection with the IMF gold sale decision, and everything is still very much on track there. On the weekend of October 5, 1975, just ten days ago, a secret meeting was held in New York City by delegates of the United States, Britain, Japan, France, and West Germany to lay the groundwork for a Western Economic Summit to be held later this year. David Rockefeller is trying to make sure that the January 1976 meeting of the IMF in Jamaica will reach a compromise agreement acceptable to France on the matter of exchange rates, so that the conditional gold agreement reached last month will then take effect. My current information is that to satisfy France stable yet flexible exchange rates between currencies will be defined in terms of gold. Gold will be officially fixed at or about $195 an ounce for this purpose, this being the first of several successive stages within a period of two and a half years from today, with gold ultimately targeted to reach $2,000 per ounce. So bankruptcy of New York City, if it comes, will serve the Rockefeller Brothers well in their scheme to bring America to submission economically. And after spending months telling President Ford, both directly and through advisors, not to help New York City, Nelson Rockefeller has suddenly hopped on the other side of the fence and now says for public consumption that Federal authorities should help New York. But this is only lip service, my friends, for behind the scenes he is still making sure that ultimately nothing is done. Now when the ultimate collapse comes, it will be President Ford, not Nelson Rockefeller, the real culprit, who is blamed for not effecting a rescue. Along with Ford, Congress will also be the loser in all of this. On October 11, 1975, when Rockefeller went public with his statements in support of New York, he said in a speech which, please note, he did not bother to clear with his puppet Ford, and I quote, after the Control Board in New York City have acted to restore fiscal integrity, it will be a true test of the responsiveness of our Congressional system as to whether the Congress can act in time to avoid catastrophe." Unquote. This is the very same Nelson Rockefeller who, as Governor of New York State, increased New York State taxes by over 500 percent and its debt by over 300 percent and drove numerous industries, including some of his own, out of the State by confiscatory taxation. But you can rest assured that Congress will now be watched very closely by the Rockefeller mass media to see what they do about all of this. Thus the Rockefellers are trying to make us think of New York City's fate as a criterion for the continued usefulness or lack thereof of Congress. And regardless of what Congress does, they intend to make sure that Congress does not pass the public opinion test. So my friends, don't be too mystified by the strange things going on around us. Keep your eyes focused on causes, not effects, because what man makes he can unmake. In the 1920s, the Rockefellers brought a very sophisticated German economist to America from Berlin to work out a plan to massage the stock market in order, so they said, to try to deflate inflation. But once they had his plan, they promptly twisted it and used it to bring about the stock market crash of 1929. He resigned in disgust and went into a religious retreat, but later became a university professor. It was my privilege to have studied under this man, and we became good and close friends. It was he, my wise German professor, who taught me finance, banking, and economics, and who confidentially taught me to forget all about the effects the economists had written about in their books. 
even including his, and to focus instead on causes and the way these effects can be brought about. He died with shame in his heart because of the cruel way in which the Rockefellers had warped and misused what he had taught them in good faith. His identity must remain a secret, but he left with me a heavy responsibility to use what he had taught me for good, and that is what I am trying to do now for you and for him. Topic No. 3 Perhaps you are wondering why I have chosen to talk today about preparations for our new American Constitution and maneuverings for a new Asian war. All is one topic. The reason is that both are parts of the larger Rockefeller plan for world conquest and one Rockefeller world government as outlined in Hoffman Nickerson's Rockefeller authorized book, The American Rich, published in 1930. On previous occasions I have alluded to the fact that Japan since World War II has been substantially under the thumb of the four Rockefeller brothers, and in particular of John D. Rockefeller III. It was John, as I explained in AUDIO LETTER No. 3, who helped pave the way for the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor through his spy ring activities under the cloak of the Institute of Pacific Relations. If you had any doubts about what I have told you of the Rockefeller control over Japan, I hope you paid close attention to the recent visit by Emperor Hirohito to our country. From start to finish, with scarcely a break, he was in Rockefeller Company on a Rockefeller turf, from the Colonial Williamsburg, Virginia tourist attraction owned by the Rockefellers to Vice President Nelson Rockefeller's Japanese-style house in Pocantico Hills. Our figurehead, Vice uh, our figurehead President Ford and other officials hardly even counted. Nelson's brother John who is heading the publicity campaign for their own new Constitution under the banner of a second American Revolution, is still up to his old tricks in the Pacific too. On September 15, 1975, a significant article appeared in the Vancouver Province newspaper describing a hush-hush meeting that was not even reported in the United States. The article was entitled, quote, Rockefeller's Brain Trust Meeting Ends, unquote and reads in part as follows, and I quote, An informal conference of some of the Pacific Rim's most influential political and economic thinkers convened by financier John D. Rockefeller III ended here Saturday, and only then was the list of participants released. The 43 guests invited to the Williamsburg Five Conference from Southeast Asia, Australia, and North America met for four days in off-the-record sessions representing only themselves, not their organizations. Still quoting, Participants included George Ball, former U.S. Under Secretary of State, Derek Davies, editor of the authoritative Far Eastern Economic Review, Newsweek editor Osborne Elliott, Exxon Chairman C.C. C. Garvin, United States Senate Minority Leader Hugh Scott, Mitsubishi Research Director Morishi Mori, and Toman Tanat, former Thai Foreign Minister. Other guests included top-level experts from Asian and United States companies, publications, banks, universities, various ministries, and presidential circles." Unquote. In a news conference after the meeting, Robert Barnett, Director of the Washington Center of the Asia Society, was asked what effect the discussions would have on the foreign policy of various countries, and he answered, quote, I would say the probability of direct influence is very small, and the probability of indirect influence is very considerable." Unquote. It is mentioned that the conferences began in Williamsburg, Virginia five years ago to discuss, quote, the then new breakthrough in United States-Chinese relations." Unquote. The Rockefeller brothers are maneuvering rapidly to bring on the Asian War, which they plan to ignite in March 1977 as their target date. Their goal is to take over India, the former crown jewel of the British Empire, which is rich in iron ore, precious metals, and various other natural resources as well as cheap labor. Already 1,000 or so inhabitants 
of a small island in the Indian Ocean, Diego Garcia, are being involuntarily relocated elsewhere to make room for the rapid build-up of a U.S. naval base in preparation for the coming war in that area. Henry Kissinger's new controversial Sinai Accord involving 200 so-called civilian technicians to be placed in no man's land between Israel and Egypt is also a part of the global preparations for Asian war by the Rockefellers. The primary focus right now is not the Middle East itself, but Asia. Israel is, in effect, to become our advanced base for American military operations when we are drawn into the Asian conflict on the side of Russia and India and against the Sino-Japanese axes which through Japan will also be under Rockefeller influence. Huge amounts of arms are being pumped into Israel with much smaller token amounts promised to Egypt. Israel is being used while the Arabs are being placated for now to keep the region's oil supply secure for the planned war. Those so-called civilian technicians will be civilian in name only. They are actually the advanced command nuclei of the American military buildup in the Sinai that is already going on in secret. The whole purpose of this is not fundamentally to protect the Israelis and the Egyptians from one another, but to keep open the American supply line to the east for war in India. Should India fall through subversion before 1977, the war now brewing will no longer be necessary. In that event, the Rockefeller plans will revert to those described in my AUDIO BOOK No. 1, released a year ago, World War III, with America the primary nuclear battlefield, beginning just a little later than the war now planned. For that purpose, the Rockefeller brothers have as their ace in the hole the Panama Canal. It is already targeted by atomic missiles and the Republic of Guyana in Latin America. And while negotiations proceed to return partial sovereignty over the Canal Zone to Panama, the United States is negotiating to retain the right to defend the Canal indefinitely in case of attack. The Panama Canal will thus be the new Pearl Harbor, and we are to be dragged into nuclear war in its defense under that contingent war plan of the Rockefeller Brothers. Meanwhile here at home, the Rockefellers are already making war, propaganda war, economic war, and political war on us, the peasants as they call us. As I explained in my AUDIO BOOK, The Secret New Constitution for America, the Rockefellers have several contingency plans through which their new Constitution may potentially be put into effect, and they are keeping all of them alive. The primary plan is still for us to accept it by the national referendum in the midst of economic chaos a year from now. But earlier this year, for example, House Concurrent Resolution No. 28 was introduced calling for a Constitutional Convention to be called and complete its work before July 4, 1976. Under this resolution, one of the co-chairmen would be the Senate President pro tem, that is, Nelson Rockefeller. Meanwhile, the piecemeal dismantling of our constitutional rights is continuing. One of the more notorious examples lately has been Senate Bill No. 1, sponsored by a whole flock of Senate stars when it was introduced, ranging from Senator John McClellan, who ought to have known better, all the way down to uh, Nelson Rockefeller's water boy, Birch Bayh. Senate Bill No. 1 is a two-inch thick complete revision of the Federal Criminal Code with some hair-raising provisions carefully buried all through it. One of these would amount to an Official Secrets Act imposing criminal penalties on anyone who might dare to publicly expose errors or misdeeds by government officials. Another provision which ties in with the increasingly shrill cries for gun control to disarm us prior to our enslavement would effectively remove your right to defend yourself in your own home. But these are only proposals so far. Other things are taking effect now. For example, another portent of Rockefeller's proposed electoral branch of government is present in the Justice Department, 
which is usurping local authority over the conduct of elections all over America through tools provided by the Voting Rights Act of 1965. For a sobering account about this I refer you to the front page of the September 29, 1975 issue of the Daily News Digest, Post Office Box 27496, Phoenix, Arizona 85061. And speaking of the Justice Department, Attorney General Edward Levy recently took the unprecedented step of placing the FBI under his direct, immediate control. There exists no more dangerous Rockefeller agent in an entire government than Levy. All of these things are very clearly spelled out in the secret new Rockefeller Constitution, but they are only the beginning, my friends. The ten-year, multi-million dollar study that produced their horrendous new document was funded by the Rockefeller Brothers through their controlled foundations, and no clear statement of the evil philosophy that motivates the new Constitution is possible than the one given by George, by McGeorge Bundy, the Rockefeller insider who is President of their controlled Ford Foundation. He has been quoted as saying, It is better for man to build his own heaven on earth than to seek heaven in heaven through blood on a cross." Unquote. This, my friends, is the true philosophy of the four Rockefeller Brothers. They strive for their brand of a heaven on earth for themselves, even if that means hell on earth for all the rest of us. Until next month, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.